In Genesis 18, the Bible tells the story of the visitation of the angel of the Lord unto Abraham and Sarah. The Bible tells us that after Abraham had finished entertaining those angels, the angel asked for Sarah, his wife. And in verse number 9 of Genesis 18, the Bible said, Then they said unto him, Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind them. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. According to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, from this verse of the scripture, I want you to notice one thing, the unusual visitation of the Almighty God. When they were not expecting, when Abraham and Sarah were just living life and resigning to the fact that, yeah, they are old and that's the way they are going to go, the Lord Almighty visited them. The second thing I want you to notice there is the unbelievable nature of the promise of God. Bible tells us that yeah, at this time of life, at this time of at this at the time of life, in other words, next year, you are going to have a son. That was a very, very unbelievable promise that the Lord made. And the third thing I want you to notice in that verse of the, in that passage of scripture is the assurance that the Lord Almighty made that his promises will come to pass. He said, Is anything too hard for the Lord to do? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And I want you to notice what you know from the passage of scripture there that you see that Sarah laughed. When the angel, when he heard the angel promise that he was going to have a son. And the question is why? Why will Sarah be laughing at the promise that was made unto her? Before we answer that question, I want you to put a hold on it. And turn to the book of Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, if you say, you know, the Bible tells us of a story of another man. A visitation of the angel of the Almighty God to a man, to a priest called Zacharias. Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1 that Zacharias was busy performing his duty as a priest when the angel of the Almighty God came calling. Beginning from verse number 12, the Bible says, Then and when Abraham, when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this thing? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in age. And the angel answered and said, and said to him, I am Gabriel, one who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and to bring you this glad tidings. Again you will see, the same pattern repeating itself in the life of Zacharias. Just like the case of Sarah, the Bible tells us, number one, this unusual visitation. Zacharias was minding his own business, doing what he was supposed to do in the temple. And all of a sudden, an unusual visitation came from the angel of the Almighty God. The second thing you will notice there also is the unbelievable promise that the unusual visitation brought to, uh, brought to Zacharias. The Bible tells us that he said, you know, he said, you are going to have your son from this your old woman and you being old also and Zacharias said hey this is unbelievable man y'all don't mess with me this kind of things don't happen here I don't know how it happens in heaven but old people don't give birth to children in this in this neck of the wood and then the third thing you will notice is that the Lord Almighty said that you'll see is the Lord's divine assurance the angelic assurance that divine assurance that the promise that was made unto Zacharias will be fulfilled the Bible says in verse number 19 and the angel answered and said unto him I am given Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you to bring you this glad tidings. In other words, don't forget about what you think is normal. Forget about what you think is, is, is the regular routine of things. I have been sent to bring this particular message to you, which means you have the assurance that it is going to come to pass. Now you will notice that instead of laughing, Zacharias this time around was kind of puzzled. He started questioning the angel. Zacharias was basically saying, Angel, this thing looks too good to be true. I hope you know that I am an old man. I hope you know that my wife is old. And I hope you are not messing with us. And the question is, why would Zacharias be questioning the angel of the Almighty God? 
Again, I want you to put a pause in there. And let's fast forward to verse number 26 of Luke chapter 21. We're still in the same chapter. Or we're still in the same uh, Luke chapter 21. In verse number 26, the Bible tells us you have yet another visitation of an angel. This time around, it's a visitation of the angel of the Lord to a young woman named Mary. And if you pick up the story from verse number 30, the Bible tells us, Then the angel said unto her, that is said unto Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you call and shall call his name Jesus and Mary said unto the angels how can this be since I do not know a man and the angel answered and said unto her the Lord the Holy Spirit shall come will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God again you see the same pattern the life, you know, the, the, the same pattern you saw in the life of Sarah and the life of Zachariah is repeated here again in the life of Mary. The Bible tells us, as always, it started with that unusual visitation. Mary was probably just going about doing what virgins do, and all of a sudden, her life, her day was interrupted by the presence of the Almighty God. He said, Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son of God. And, the, and Mary must have lied. said, This is definitely a very, very bad joke. You know, the next thing you see was the unbelievable promise that was given unto her. Apart from the fact that it was an unusual visitation, there was an unusual promise that accompanied that visitation. He said, the end, And then Mary said unto her, How can this thing be? In other words, how can you tell me? A girl that has never had it, that does not know a man, how can I bring forth a child? This is an unbelievable promise. And then you also so see, to be able to assure Mary that this was going to come to pass, you see that divine assurance given by the angel to the fulfillment of the promise of the Almighty God. And verse number 35, the Bible tells us, yes, it might be impossible unto you, but verse 35 said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is how the Lord will do it. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One which you'll be born of will be called the Son of God. Now, in the case of Mary, the Bible tells us that Mary was just confused. Sarah was laughing because it was ridiculous to her. Isaiah Zacharias was confused because he couldn't understand how that would happen. But Sarah was able, but Mary was just, it was just funny. It was just, you know, Mary was just confused. I mean, I'm a virgin. I don't know anybody. How can you do this thing to me? Mary must have said to the angel, oh God, angel, this is how, let's, let's, let's get this thing straight. I don't know how you guys do it in heaven, but here on earth, you don't just declare a girl pregnant. You don't just do that. It takes two to tangle in this neck of the wood. I hope you understand that. And the angel just said, angel replied and said unto her, he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. I understand it takes two to tango. But this time around, you are tangling with the angel of the Almighty. You are tangling with the Spirit of the Almighty God. So the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And you, therefore, also the Holy One which is born of you, shall be called the Son of God. In other words, this thing is going to happen by the power of the Almighty God. And so Mary was confused. And the question is, why was she confused? Why was Sarah laughing? Why was Zacharias asking questions? Why did each of these three personalities, the three individuals that we talked about in Scripture, why did they respond the way they responded? Why did they respond in such a way that after hearing the news of what was told unto them, this, these individuals had questions. They laughed and they doubted and they were confused. They raved them. But one reason was because the, what they were told was just an unexpected word that, would, that was thrown into their routine of life. In other words, you're going about your daily life. All of a sudden, somebody just tells you, you're going to have a son. I said, come on, man. You can play another joke on me, but that is one expensive joke. So they could, they responded the way they responded because it was an unexpected visit of the word of God. Number two, they responded the way they responded because it was such an unbelievable statement that was made unto them. Number one, Sarah was old. Zechariah was old. Mary was a virgin. You don't expect those kind of things. The word of God that was pronounced unto them, you don't expect it coming to life in the lives of these individuals. And number three, it was impossible to accomplish by the natural, by the natural order of things. Old people who are past menopause don't give birth to children. Young girls who do not know have any sexual relationship do not give birth to children. And that was why they responded the way they responded. Because it was impossible to accomplish by the normal means of things. And so, 
These three individuals, because of the fact that by nature these things are not supposed to happen, they responded the way they responded. And the interesting thing about the response of these three individuals by the visitation of the Almighty God is that that same response is what we are still seeing even in the body of Christ today. There are people who are still laughing at the possibility of a savior. There are those who are still questioning the reality of the virgin birth. There are those who are still confused about the need for a savior. But I want you to understand one thing, that although Sarah laughed, although Zacharias questioned the angel, although Mary was confused about the message that she received, you will notice that in the lives of all these three individuals, the word of God still became fulfilled. The word of God that came to them unexpectedly came for, was still fulfilled. The word of God that appeared unbelievable still became fulfilled. The word of God that appeared impossible to be accomplished by the natural way of things was still made possible. It still came to pass in their life. The word of God that was spoken into their life became flesh. And that is what we are going to be focusing our attention on today. The word of God that becomes flesh in the life of an individual. Now, when we say the word becoming flesh, what are we talking about? When we say the word of God becoming flesh, what are we referring to? We're talking about the word of God becoming flesh means the fulfillment of the promise of God in your life. That's what it means. The fulfillment of the promise of God. He said, blessed is he who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of the things which were told to her from the Lord. That is what it means when we say the word of God becomes flesh. When we talk about the word of God becoming flesh, we're talking about the, you, you experiencing the reality of the promise of God, of the word of God in your life. Not just hearing the word, but seeing the word become a reality. Seeing the word becoming part of your experience. That is what we mean when we talk about the word becoming life. When we talk about the word becoming flesh, we're talking about when faith. When the word of God, through faith, becomes, you know, transform your life, uh, transform your life so that you begin to see a change for the better. That's what we mean when we talk about the word becoming life, the word becoming, uh, the word beco becoming flesh. When we talk about the word becoming flesh, we're talking about when Christ becomes real in your life uh, through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. When you believe that Christ died and rose again, and you accept that particular, and you accept that reality by faith, then the word of God starts to become flesh in your life. That's what we mean. And that is what, you know, that is what we mean. So now, we, you know, some might be asking, how does this happen? How does the process of the word becoming flesh, how does it happen in the life of an individual? How does the word become flesh in my life? The word become flesh in your life, number one, when you hear the revealed word of God. When Sarah heard the word, he said, by this time you are going to, at this time next year you are going to have a child. At the time of life you shall bring forth a son. When she heard that word, that was what kick-started the process of the word becoming life. When Mary heard that the angel of the Almighty God has come unto her and that she has been favored by the Almighty God to become the mother of the Savior, that kick-started the process of what? Of the word becoming life. And that's why the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 10, if you read from verse number 17, it said, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So the word becomes flesh when we hear the revealed word. Number two, when we receive the revealed word. It is one thing for you to hear the word. It's another thing to embrace the word. If Sarah antagonized the word and said, no, forget about it, that's not going to happen. If Zacharias began to challenge and said, no, I don't believe that thing that you're saying, you are just an illusion. If Mary said, no, that is not going to happen. You will find out that the word of God that was spoken to them, that is confirmed by an angel, that is backed up by the oath of the Almighty God, that word will not find full expression in their lives. For the word of God to find, to become flesh, there has to be the hearing of the word. There has to be the receiving of the word. And then number three, there has to be the believing of the word. The believing of the word. The Bible says many that received him. To them he gave them the right to become the sons of God. Even those who believe in his name. So the transforming power of the almighty God that makes the word become flesh. Has to be, has to be heard. It has to be received and it has to be believed. For it to become flesh. But most importantly the word has to be engaged. The revealed word has to be engaged for it to become flesh. The Bible says, all that the Father give me will come to me. And the one who comes to me will by no way, will I by no means cast out. In other words, there has to be your action acting upon the word. You have to take an action. 
We are all know, we are all, most of us who are in church are very familiar with the idea when we say salvation is free. But salvation is free for only those who are willing to confess. A man who is too big to confess is too big to be saved. The same thing here. The word will not become flesh unless you hear it, unless you receive it, unless you believe it, and unless you engage it. And by engaging means that you take the word and you act upon it. You fulfill the requirement of the word and then the Lord Almighty is now committed to fulfilling what he says he's going to do. And then finally the word becomes flesh when we surrender to the revealed word. In other words, when you don't struggle with the word, when you are not challenging the word of God, when you are not debating with the word of God, when you are not turning the word of God and making it to fit your own image, but when you surrender to it and say, Lord, this is what you say, I believe it, and I'm going to act upon it. Then the word of God becomes flesh. The question then now, what happens? What happens in your life? What happens in my life when the word becomes flesh? When the word of God becomes flesh and it begins to bring transformation, the first thing you are going to notice is that heaven is going to rejoice. Bible tells in the book of Luke, I say, I say unto you, that whosoever, uh, that, uh, that uh, I say unto you likewise, moreover, there shall, there's joy, uh, there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repented than over 99 the joy, uh, just person who need no repentance. In other words, as soon as you accept the word of God, uh, as soon as the word, be- the process of the word becoming flesh is, uh, is, uh, is initiated in your life, there is joy in heaven. Why there is joy in heaven for the word that becomes flesh, the earth will notice it. Acts chapter 4 verse number 13 tells us, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took notes concerning them that they were with, they had been with Jesus. As soon as the word becomes flesh in your life, the whole world will know. You that used to live a righteous life, now you are living a transformed life. You that used to be a very a very deceptive person, now you are a very honest and straightforward person. You whose life has been a, a, a very injurious life, you find that a lot of life is not transformed, the world will notice. When the world becomes flesh, heaven rejoices, the earth notices, but number three, hell is enraged. The devils become very angry because they know that one of, the, one of their captives has been lost again. And that's what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, Revelation chapter 13. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And, to, and the power was given over, given, to, given him over all, man, over all kindred and tongues and nation. But when Jesus becomes the Lord of any life, this particular power is taken away and hell becomes enraged. So when the word becomes flesh in your life, the first thing you will notice is heaven will rejoice, the earth will notice, but the hell will be enraged. But not only that, when the word becomes flesh in our life, there are also visible evidence in the life of the person who has been transformed. And the first visible sign that you will see is the sign of a new and a transformed life. Bible tells us, say, if any man be in Christ. In other words, if the word has become flesh in your life, it's a li- oh, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So one of the evidence that you will see in the life where the word has become flesh is that new and transformation, a new and a transformed life is the evidence that you see. The next thing you see is the miraculous healing that takes place. When the word becomes flesh in your life, concerning a particular issue in your life, you will see the miraculous healing hand of the Almighty God. When the word becomes flesh, you will see supernatural provision. When the word becomes flesh, divine deliverance begins to take place. When the word becomes flesh, the individual becomes what? An overcomer in life. That's what happens when the word becomes flesh. Now the interesting thing is this. If these are the things that happen in the life that, that in, the, in a transformed life, and many of us really desire this thing, we desire to be an overcomer. We desire to have deliverance. We desire to have supernatural provision and supernatural healing. If all these things are what are the results of a transformed life, are the result of the word becoming flesh, the question that always bothers my mind has been that why in the world will somebody not want to have this world become flesh in their lives? Why would somebody not want the word to become flesh in their lives? Why would somebody want, not want to accept Jesus and to have Jesus do the work that he has been doing in the lives of countless millions all across the world? Why would they not want it? Let's look at Matthew chapter 13. And in there the Lord gives us an answer. Matthew chapter 13. We start reading from verse number 53. The Bible says, Now it came to pass 
when Jesus had finished this parable, that he departed from there. And when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and this mighty work? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, his brother James, Joseph, Simeon and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended by him because Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. In other words, a lot of people do not allow the word of God to become flesh in their life. Because number one, they refuse to receive the word that has become flesh, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. As long as you refuse to receive the word, as long as you fail to receive the word, as long as you have made up your mind that you are not, you are not interested in the word, the word can never become flesh. Number two, a lot of people do not, the word does not become flesh in the life of people because a lot of people are offended by the word. There are people who are twisted out of shape just for hearing the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are people who are so angry with a name that they claim does not exist. That is still the part I don't understand. You're saying that this is a figment of people's imagination. And yet somebody mentions it and you are twisted out of shape. It is still, it's still, it's still incredible. But the thing is that the word will not become flesh when you are offended by the word that became flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, the word will not become flesh in our lives when we dishonor the word in our mind, in our action, in the things that we say. Look at what they said. There, what they said to him. They say, "Is this not the? Is this not the carpenter's son?" Is this not the, is this not the, is not his mother Mary or his brothers James and Jonas and we know his sister. How come all of a sudden he's now claiming to be the son of God? You know what this is, I mean, this guy's an imposter. That's basically what they were saying. When the dishonor, when you dishonor the word of God, when you demean the word of God, when you, when you belittle the word of God, it can never become flesh in your life. And then number four, the word will not become flesh when you refuse to believe it. Bible tells us that Jesus went about doing good, healing the blind, healing the sick, and giving sight to the blind, delivering all those who were oppressed. But when he got to his own country, the Bible said he could not do any mighty work. Why? Because the people simply refused to believe in him. They saw in him the carpenter's stone instead of seeing the Savior. They saw in him one of the people who was probably riding bicycle on the street when they were growing up, and they refused to see the anointing of the Almighty God upon his life. What I'm saying in essence is that when you refuse, when you refuse to be able, when you refuse to believe the word of God, the word of God can never become flesh in your life. Bible says, now they did not, he did not many mighty works there. Matthew 13, 5, 28. You, he did not mighty, many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The question then now is, how do you as an individual position yourself so that you don't become like the people that were in the city of our Lord Jesus Christ? How do you position yourself so that you can now begin to receive, that you can receive the word that will become flesh in your life and transform your life? How do you do that? Number one, you do that by being open to his visitation. Being open to his visitation. Luke chapter 1, if you read from verse 20, 26, the Bible says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent, to, was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And Mary, when he met that angel, was open to that visitation. When the word of God comes, the word of God that will transform your life, the word of God that will become flesh for you, that you will see the manifestation in your life, must be the word of God that you are open to. You must be open to the visitation of the Almighty God for you, to, for the word to become flesh. Number two, there has to be a genuine curiosity. If you read the account in the book of Luke chapter 1, the response of the angel to Zechariah and the response of the angel to Mary, there were two different responses. Zacharias asked, how can this thing be? Mary asked, how can this, uh, this thing be? Zachariah got a whooping by being, by being deaf and mute for the, uh, the, in the duration of, the, of when the baby was still in the womb. Mary, on the other hand, got the grace of God. The point we are making is that one was a genuine curiosity, the other one was out of doubt. 
And if you are going to see the word of God transformed, becoming life in our lives, we must have what is called genuine curiosity. And not only that, for the word of God to become flesh in our life, we have to allow God to be God. Mary said to the angel, how can this thing be since I know no man? In other words, I am here. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'll be, I'll, it will be interesting for me to know how. And the angel said, the spirit of the Almighty God will come upon you. The power of the Almighty God will overshadow you. And something, a transformation will take place. You allow God to be God. You don't figure him out. You don't try to second guess him. You don't try to debate him. You don't try to analyze him. If you want to see the word of God become, you know, if we want to position ourselves to see the word of God become flesh. Not only that. For us to be able, the word of God, for us to be, for the word of God to become flesh in our life, we must apply simple faith. Mary said unto that angel when she came visiting, he said, Behold, I made him servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. In other words, I accept, I surrender, I believe. I'm not willing to debate. I'm not going to argue with you. You said it's going to be, then it's going to be. I said, he said Behold, I made him servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And then, I also have what is called the willing acceptance. Let it be according to your word. No argument, no debate, no challenge. When you do these things, that is when you begin to experience the word of God becoming flesh in our life. The question this very evening is, as we close out on this, uh, on our Christmas Eve service, is that uh, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the eternal word of God that came to life. The question for us is that, they must, or is, is the word becoming flesh in your own individual life? Because all across the world, the word of God is still becoming flesh. Many are still turning to Christ. Many are still enjoying the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of a relationship with the Almighty God. The question is that there is the word of God becoming flesh in your life. Regardless of the opposition, regardless of the persecution, regardless of all the challenges that are still going on, the word of God is still transforming life. The word of God is still healing. The word of God is still delivering. The word of God is still setting captives free. Despite all the mockery, the onslaught of hell, the word of God is still marching forward. The eternal word of God that became that became flesh on the first Christmas day, you know, is still healing and delivering millions every day all around the world. And this, question, and this evening, the question for us is that, is the word of God going to become flesh in your life? Is it going to be, become flesh in the area of salvation? Is it going to become flesh in the area of healing? Is it going to become flesh in the area of deliverance? Is it going to become flesh in the area of provision in your life? In what area of our life is the word of God going to become flesh? And for those of us who are trusting the Lord to become flesh, the word of God to become flesh in our life in the area of salvation, all you have to do is just say, Lord, I recognize you as my Lord and my Savior. And I come before you today, repenting of my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. And I say, if, and if you sincerely pray that prayer, and you say, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior, and I ask you to write my name in the last book of life, if you believe that sincerely, this very evening, the Lord Almighty makes us to understand. The, word, the, the scripture makes us to understand that salvation comes to those who will confess. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, then you will be saved. That is the word of God becoming life, becoming flesh in our own life. And for as many who are willing to do that, the Lord Almighty is willing to accept. The question this evening, as I repeat all over again, is that are you willing to trust him so that the word, the promises that he makes for us in scripture can become a reality in our lives? Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God this evening.